aspect of insurance here in Portugal. So thank you for being here tonight. Uh, also with us, uh, Daniel Reis of Reis and Pelicano. How are you, Daniel? Hello, hello. Quite all right. I missed last session, so uh, I was missing you, Carl, and the rest of the team. Well, the, we missed you too. What's new in the world of law, my friend? Well, um, for the time being, there's a few things being assessed by the, the president regarding the nationality of uh, Sephardic Jews. So he has sent the diploma to be assessed in the um, constitutional court. Um, but we don't have any results on that yet, so yeah. we'll need to wait. But um, the president does have some uh, questions or doubts about the constitutionality of um, the, the new diploma uh, of the nationality of law regarding Sephardic Jews. So I think that we'll have some uh, further developments, I would say, in uh, two or three months in that regard. And I'm um, uh, waiting for them eagerly. So let's let's see what uh, what uh, that comes of fruition. But that's the, the main um, news that I have to report for the time being. And what's actually going on? Thank you for that. And what's actually going on in the Portuguese parliament at the moment? It's officially... <laughs> You're laughing. I haven't finished my question yet. But maybe that's enough, right, to be getting on with. What is going on in the Portuguese? Well, are, are you considering Madeira, Açores, or the, the, the parliament in uh, mainland Portugal? Mainland. We could get to the okay. others. But what's happening in the mainland? The dissolution has occurred, has it not? Yeah, it, it did, uh, did indeed occur. So the, the government doesn't have... Uh, um, well, they don't have powers to enact on anything. It's just managerial powers until the elections come up. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be slow times, I would say, in terms of uh, new laws and new diplomas to for us to assess until the new government takes uh, takes uh, power and the new uh, parliament is indeed elected. So um, we're not counting on any major changes in any of the diplomas that usually affect foreigners. And this is nationality law, foreigners law, and uh, so on. Uh, for the next, for, next foreseeable future, let's say four or five months, because we'll have the elections. After the elections, um, the, 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 the president will need to basically concede the power to the, the, the party that gains more support in the parliament. They will need to, to get uh, in, uh, fully vested in their powers. So this takes some, some time and then they'll, not, they'll start producing some laws. So four or five months of uh, peace and quiet, hopefully, in terms of uh, uh, new laws. Uh, it's going to be interesting, though, in uh, um, uh, uh, just following the, the, the news about the, the politicians and uh, uh, what is going to be the composition of this new parliament. So on, on the political side, it's going to be interesting. On the law side, it's going to be slow, I think. OK, and, and so it's heads down for all the politicians hoping to be re-elected. Uh, that's probably their main concern at the moment. And then yep. when they get back to business and actually start proposing and making law, when will those f first laws see the light of day? Will it be towards the end of the year? Well, it, it does depend on what type of uh, laws are you referring to. If, if the same guys that are still in power keep on being in power, um, I don't think that will have any changes in the budget. Right. But if the power uh, changes hands, I, I do think that the first law that they're going to amend and change is indeed the budget, because that, that's the main uh, document that uh, enables a, a party to rule over uh, the, the country. So uh, the first thing that they will change for sure is going to be the budget. Uh, then it depends a, a bit on the, the, the guys that get elected. But I would say that after they get elected, they can approve laws straight away. Uh -huh. um, but it, for major things, it will take a while. Let's say three months for major diplomas to be assessed and discussed. So, and then it gets to recess, August, nothing happens in Portugal in August. So about September, October, we may have some uh, some developments. Excellent. Uh, you know what was behind my question? It's like, you know, when do people need to be getting concerned about, about what's going on in the parliament again? So after the summer recess, by the sound of it, yeah. when they're all back <laughs> at work. Thanks, Daniel. Any questions about the law here in Portugal uh, and any help you might need legally here in Portugal, we can ask uh, Daniel this evening. And do get those questions into the chat if you will. Uh, Laronda, good evening to you. Uh, a disappointment Pointed that you weren't able to see the earlier session. This was on US taxes, uh, filing US taxes with Greenback um, Expat Taxes Services. Uh, that webinar recording will be available from Sunday at six o'clock. And Sherry is here. Uh, great job, Sherry. Uh, you're still with us, right? At five o'clock in the morning in the Philippines, as I understand it. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. You was you started work this morning at three thirty. No one else. I think you have the bragging rights for the earliest start. <laughs> um, I imagine hands down. So thank you. Your Ramar is shocked by that. Uh, Ramar has only just started work at nine o'clock in the evening, Portuguese style. I just woke up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Sh Shari, thanks so much for being here. And any questions you might have, including you, LaRonda, anything you feel you may have missed or wanted to ask uh, in the US uh, tax session, uh, you can ask those of Shari tonight. So thanks for being here, Shari. Really appreciate you. Uh, let's stay with you, Ramar. Uh, how are you this evening? How's the world of uh, finance and mortgages here in Portugal? I'm very good. Thank you. Very happy to be with you tonight. So obviously, I did not uh, just woke up because uh, there's a lot of demand. And uh, actually, everyone wants to do what we've done Par, and come to Portugal. Uh, yes. I, I'm very happy to to see uh, the the shift uh, like in between the, the beginning of this year and the end of last year. I think a lot of people were pretty scared, you know, when we were talking about the end of the NHR and everything. And I don't know, I can feel something, you know, a breath of fresh air. And um, and this is a pretty cool environment to to work in right now. So yeah, a lot of new people coming in and I'm very happy for that. Despite all of those um, clickbait doom mongers on YouTube, uh, I should say as well, we need some pushback against those people who are exploiting certain things they hear and whipping them up into a storm on YouTube. Great country to come to, Portugal, and the Dream Team are here tonight to help you do that. So thanks, Roman, for being here. Any questions about mortgages and raising finance to buy a home, uh, Roman is here to help you and is in the business directory along with all the Dream Team members here tonight. I see Gilda is here. Queen of the Visas, how are you? Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. How are you? Muito bem, obrigado. Contigo? Muito bem. And how's the world of visas, Gilda? You're looking well on it. Yeah, everything is uh, is going fine. Um, we are just uh, waiting for IMA's uh, improvements. Um, it seems that there are some news that they are starting to accept some uh, family reunions online. So they are starting to testing them now. Very good. Um, so we are expecting to see how it goes. Brilliant. Okay, but nothing tangible to report, just business as usual, dealing with, they're dealing with the backlog and you're still helping people to come into Portugal. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, Casa Portuguesa as well, helping people to find a home, whether that be a rental or a purchase as well. Um, there are a lot of people on the call tonight. If um, I haven't seen you as a Dream Team member, and I suspect that would include Sarah. Sarah, good evening to you. Thanks, Gilda, for the time being. Any visa questions for Gilda, just do pop them in the chat, please, and over on YouTube too. Sarah, I think there have been some announcements that may affect the currency markets. It's been a bit, a bit of an exciting start to the week, hasn't it? It is, yes. It's still all about really um, uh, inflation and um, whether the central banks are going to cut or keep interest rates on hold. Basically, that's really the theme at the moment. Um, certainly, if you're in the UK and you're uh, selling sterling and buying euros, it is a good time. Um, basically, um, they're really looking to try and get inflation back down to 2%. That's the real focus. So it may be that we won't see them. Uh, cut interest rates just yet and even the Fed have come out and really kind of saying they want to see if inflation is maintained um, and before they start increase, um, cutting interest rates as well. I think for a lot of our customers the, the key thing really is what are your time frames because you know we could be talking if you're looking at moving money in the next month that's a different story to people that are looking to move money in the next three months six months We've got clients that are thinking about buying property this year. And if, the say, for example, the Fed look to um, cut interest rates in the future, then that could weaken the US dollar um, and make it more expensive for people to buy their euros. So people are thinking ahead of time, if I'm thinking about buying property in perhaps the mid to longer term, should I be looking to buy my euros now? Will that make it cheaper? So those are the sort of things that we're trying to help people navigate really it's it's getting to understand what are your time frames and what mm. could that look like for you okay excellent thank you any questions then about uh, fx currency exchange with spartan fx who you can open a free account with uh, pop those into the chat for sarah tonight and last but not least on the introductions on the dream team panel unless there's anyone else i've missed uh, henry and jason from holborn assets good evening gentlemen Hi there, carl. good evening carl how are you doing 
Good to see you. Good to see you. How's uh, how's life in the Algarve? Very good, thank you. Yeah, very good. I've been uh, traveling quite a bit this month. But yeah, life is good, thank you. It's been a bit of a, a whirlwind month, obviously on the back end of December, um, with the uh, the rule changes to the golden visa and, and property no longer being uh, an option for the program. But uh, it would seem uh, demand has not slowed. So yeah, it's been a, a, been good, busy, uh, a good start to the year. Um, before we talk more about that, because you're hosting a webinar next week about that at six o'clock or, or Thursday of next week. Have you been in the water yet, Jason, in the Algarve? Have you been for a swim this year? No, I've not, definitely not. I've not been in the, the water for uh, a good six months now, Carl. I, I was in I was in the bay. Summer. I was in the bay yesterday in San Martino de Porto for the first time this year. It was fantastic. OK, well, tell us more about the webinar coming up for next week. Uh, yeah, well, it's the first one of the year, Carl. So I'm going to be bringing everyone up to speed with the latest changes, of course, that started in 2024. Uh, the new investment criteria for those looking to qualify with the golden visa uh, for Portugal. Uh, of course, the latest announcements uh, with regard to the time it now takes to get the visa, uh, as uh, we covered before, now looking much more promising with AMA. Uh, we had an announcement a couple of weeks back from the government to say that the application period now counts towards the five-year requirement for the passport as well, oh, which yeah. is great. So that, that kind of speeds the passport time up by kind of 12 to 18 months. Uh, and of course, yeah, giving everyone an idea on the different investment routes available now to, uh, to qualify for the Golden Pass. Great. Okay. The so NIP pass. Join you next Thursday evening at six o'clock. Um, anything to add to that, Henry? Good, good evening and good to see you. Good evening, Carl. Good to speak to you. It's been a while. Um, from the financial planning and wealth management side of things, uh, January has been a busy month. Tax reporting season for Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and also it seems that the dust has now settled from the NHR announcement. People are starting to not to panic, but getting back to planning for their finances and making the move. So, yeah, everything's right. well over here. Good. And if you want to speak to Jason or Henry in the meantime, find Holborn Assets in the Expats Portugal business directory. Right. Are those These questions are a little sparse. Everyone's a little bit dumbstruck this evening or a bit quiet. Maybe it was that tax webinar um, earlier on this evening. But if you've got any questions for any of the panel tonight, um, do ask them in the chat. I know we've got a couple over on YouTube. First coming in on Zoom, um, this is from, um, oh, a quick hello to Susie. A hello from San Francisco, soon to be watching from Tamar uh, in March. That's great news. Thank you for sharing that milestone. Always love to hear those uh, when people are coming to Portugal and celebrating any good news. Alex is asking, this is probably for you, Gilda, have any NHR applications been already approved in 2024 under the transitory extension. Susie's was approved in early January. Uh, it may have been you that helped uh, there, Gilda. Have you seen any others been approved uh, this month so far? Oh, sorry, yes. last month. It's February already, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, we had we had some approvals under the um, transitory regime already. Although, I must say that um, it's easier to use a lawyer and go there in person because um, those that we have tried uh, to do online uh, did not succeed. Uh -huh. We got uh, uh, one answer that uh, was something like this. Uh, we don't understand what you're talking about. And then <laughs> we said... Oh. We are talking about the transitory regime uh, that was um, approved um, by the um, the the state uh, budget for twenty twenty four, and the answer was we don't know anything about it, so we are just um, following the law of twenty twenty three. Right, the status surreal. Quo. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, having this said, uh, from from then on, we are only working uh, with this in person. Right. Okay. Um, Tamara is saying mine was uh, denied via online. EI has just submitted an appeal for me. So you can do that for people, right, Gilda? Yes. Right. Yes, you can. Okay. They said transi what? This is the transitory extension. 
other under. Uh, do do give us a little bit more info if you'd like me to to turn that into a full blown a full blown question for either Gilda or Daniel. Um, this may may be for you as well, Gilda. Although Graham is asking, uh, good evening on YouTube. Can you ask Daniel if he can see any way for the NHR for pension income being changed to what it was? I'm not in, entirely sure I understand that question. Is that a, a reinstatement possibly of the NHR? Um, yeah. What do you make of that, Daniel? And what's the uh, likelihood? That's what I was alluding to, I think, when it came to making changes to the law in the, in, in, in the new parliament. It doesn't seem to have uh, political traction nowadays for something like that to, to occur, especially because of the um, property crisis or the habitation crisis that the country is facing. Uh, therefore, anything that is um, foreseen by the general public as being beneficial to attract more um, people to Portugal and um, to provide the tax benefits, uh, it will, in the eyes of the general public, uh, aggravate or uh, worsen the situation on the, um, the habitation uh, crisis. And therefore, I, I don't think it will have any traction to, to suffer any changes. So this is my assessment. Um, uh, and I, I don't think even if the, the political tide does change, that the new guys that will eventually come up will uh, will have um, will have wiggle room to reinstate the NHR. Uh, I don't wish to be pessimistic, but this is my assessment out of the situation. No, I understand that, but people do live in hope, nonetheless, don't they? <laughs> Ever hopeful of this? I hope that. Well, it doesn't really help Graham, does it? But that's, that's an honest answer from from Daniel there. Uh, let's stay with you and from Mr. S in Portuguese. I'll see what I can do here. Olá, Daniel. A partir de quando começa a conta gente para quem recebeu o visto de D7 uh, para obter a naturalidade portuguesa? Uh, so th th that's indeed a, an interesting question. I think that Jason was the one that approached um, the, the topic, and um, the law was uh, really generic about uh, about this uh, this situation, and it didn't cover the time that the applicants were waiting. So, the recent change that happened to the nationality law indeed allows the applicant to use the time that they were waiting for the process to be started. Um, and uh, th this goes for golden visas and manifestação de interesse, as they were quite um, waiting for quite a long time. In terms of D7s, D2s, and other visas, I think the, my assessment out of the law is that the, the time will be counted from, from the time that the visa was issued. Because between the time that the visa is uh, indeed requested and the time that is issued, um, the legal deadline is 60 working days from what Joda usually states. It's around uh, three to four months for a visa to be issued. So uh, I, I don't think that that time, that waiting time will be accounted for, but we still need a guinea pig. We need a tech, uh, 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 someone to test this, uh, this theory on. And we can indeed uh, request a document that will clear out all, uh, all questions regarding the the, um, the math or the uh, accountancy of time. And this is a certificate of um, counting of time issued by IMA or SEF that will basically state how long that, does that person is considered a resident in Portugal and thus uh, we can do the math five years from that date onward until the time that the nationality request can be, can be um, basically submitted. But um, in, um, in short, for manifestação de interesse, or the expression of interest in golden visas, um, the assessment that we do in our law from, from the law is from the time that the, the submission of the process is done. So from the time that we press send and the process is submitted and the fees are paid. Paying the fees for the golden visa is an important uh, um, piece of uh, information regarding the submission of the process. As for D7s, D2s and other types of visas, the, um, the assessment that I have from the law is from the time that the visa is granted onward, and this still gains uh, some, uh, some time to the applicant because at the end of the day, between the time that the visa is granted and the time that the, the residency permit is granted, four, six months, sometimes more time can elapse. So they still um, are uh, gaining um, some time with, with the, the, the law as it is, okay? Oh, that's great. Thanks, Daniel. Let's stay with you because Hamad is asking, and you may have answered this, but if we could just clarify. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, when the new nationality law on processing time will be decided by the president? I think you said that's what the president was up to. Did you mention the timescale on that? 
Well, we, we don't know uh, when the, the situation about the Sephardic Jews will be decided upon, but the reading that we have is that the rest of the law uh, will indeed be in, um, in place. But uh, wh where is the question again? Uh, it's over on YouTube. Hi, everyone. Oh. When, you, when new nationality law and processing time will be decided by the president, uh, and also does this law impact the permanent residency time as well? So the... Oh, that's all permanent good. residency oh. time to obtain the, the permanent residency card. I would say it doesn't affect it because this is a change in the nationality law. It's not a change in the foreigner's law in the issuance of a residency card. So the assessment that I have is to obtain the permanent residency card, you'll need to wait five years until uh, five years of having the card until the, the time that the permanent residency card can be requested. Uh, as this is a change in the nationality law, the nationality law can be requested uh, on year five plus one day. So basically the two things should be requested at the same time because, um, well, as nationality takes quite a bit of time to be granted nowadays, around, let's say, 30 months um, or a year, two years and a half, um, the applicant, if he wishes to remain in Portugal, you will need a document to basically justify his presence here. And this is, of course, a residency card. And this is a permanent residency card. So uh, um, there may be a difference between the two um, between the two processes. But the usual recommendation that we have is that the client should indeed request a permanent residency card and apply for the nationality if they wish to stay in Portugal. Very good. There you go, uh, Hamad. Hope that helps. And let's stay with you, Daniel, for a little more. This seems to be the theme of the evening uh, at the citizenship. Uh, hello, says John. Thank you very much for the stream. I hold a few citizenships, but never visited my countries of citizenship. Do I need to provide criminal records from all my countries of citizenship? And in theory, on the Justice uh, website saying that I need to provide only from countries where I lived. And there's more Portuguese, but I think you get the gist of the question there. Yeah. Yeah. So indeed, what the, 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 the Portuguese law states is that all the, the countries that that person lived after 16 and lived for more than a year. Um, the, the advice that I have on these situations is that the applicant should deliver his main passport, the, the nationality that he uses more often, and deliver the criminal record regarding that nationality. And, and hopefully it does coincide with one of the countries that he lived for more than a, a year. And uh, the remaining passports and uh, uh, criminal records, well... Don't ask, don't tell. That's basically the po policy. If the, the, the Portuguese uh, uh, civil registry, they don't ask about the situation, I think that the applicant should not state um, that they have other nationalities as long as they're not violating the law. And if they're, they've never lived in, uh, uh, in those countries for more than a year, uh, not request or not submitting the criminal record is not violating the law. So in short, submit one passport with that nationality application, uh, waive the, the, the rest. And that, that's basically it. That's the, the main advice that I have on that, on that regard. That's great. And I'm sure very helpful to John. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that. Um, Linda, I've got your question and I'm going to pop that in at the end as our special cultural question there and ask in the panel about uh, classical music. And if you're not a classical music fan, um, maybe your favourite your, your favorite genre and your best place to hear it here in Portugal. Um, so we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Stephanie asked a question of you, Gilda. We applied for our D7 on the 12th of October from New York, and it's been over 110 days now. We haven't heard a peep. Uh, EI, Constanza, is trying to reach the consulate. Any advice? Looking for a little bit of hope here, Gilda. Any advice other than to keep taking deep breaths? That's that's uh, Stephanie saying that and not me uh, take, taking deep breaths. But I will say hashtag calma, hashtag tranquilo. Uh, Gilda, over to you. October, November, December, New York. 110 days so far. It's already with Constanza. Constanza, she's very good with this. Uh, I can talk to it with her tomorrow. Let me. That's perfect. Okay, that is, the the call took a real quiz show kind of who wants to be a millionaire uh, moment there. Is that your final answer, Gilda? Yeah, because if it's already with Constanza, um... she's the best. 
Yeah, she's, uh, yeah, Constanza and Renata, they are both very good uh, in chasing the consulates. Okay, um, I mean, yeah, New York are just difficult. and, and Yeah, diff forever. New York, it's, it's like sometimes um, it's uh, it's very fast and sometimes it takes a, a, a long time. It's not a consistent uh, consulate. Uh, the good news is if there was a problem, it would be very fast uh, saying uh, it, there is a problem. So if it didn't say anything, it's because it's fine. Oh, okay, no um, news, good news there. They're on that. Yes, yeah, but I, um, I'm I'm going to ask Con Constanza to check it again tomorrow. All right. Special note going through to Constanza, who Stephanie says is excellent. So yeah, we understand why you're asking the question. It is difficult, isn't it, playing the waiting game? So definitely the deep breaths. And Gilda will ask uh, Constanza yeah. tomorrow morning what's happening there. Uh, another D7 question for you here, Gilda, from Michael. Thanks, Michael. Good to see you here. Uh, we have D7 visas issued in September with no Seth Imer appointment. And frankly, doesn't look like there will be one for a long time. But we did manage to get NHR status in November, thanks to EI. As we don't really have status, do we still have to file a tax return in Portugal? Good question. Yes, they do, because now they became a tax resident in Portugal. Okay, uh, there you go. Simple answer to that, Michael. And I, I'm hoping you'll be able to pick this up as the founder of Casa Portuguesa. Um, this is a question about uh, rentals that seem to be coming up. Who is it who asked this? Oh, Tom. Tom, thanks for being here. I'm seeing more places for rent appearing on my Idealista searches. Um, is the property market starting mm -hmm. to open up or is this seasonal, would you say, uh, to Tom? Um, I think that uh, maybe it started uh, to opening up. Okay, a little bit more of rental inventory coming onto the market. Yes, because uh, what I see is that, uh, well, there are many uh, Portuguese going away. So oh. they are putting their homes to rental. In what way? In terms of um, emigration? Yes. Really? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, the, um, the immigration in Portugal has uh, increased a lot. My goodness. Okay. That's something, yeah, that's uh, interesting and, and somewhat sad to hear as well. I mean, obviously, don't want to be patronizing. People have got to go where they've got to go in the rest of the world for, the, for their best possible opportunity. Um, but interesting to see that that might be part of what Tom's observing here. And is that a seasonal thing? Would that normally happen at this time of year, Gilda, or is that in response to the political situation? It's in response to the political situation. Wow. And of course, you handle those cases for people moving from Portugal as well as into Portugal. So you'll yes. have to handle that's on that. That's why I have that, that, yep. that kind of view. Yep. OK. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks for the question, Tom. Uh, Rebecca, coming back on New York here. If we're supposed to go through New York, is, is that any option or is there any option to go anywhere else how about boston newark or providence um uh, is there an alternative to vfs in new york uh well you you are not supposed to choose the consulate uh where uh, you have to submit your process because you need to prove um you need to prove uh, where you live and and it's like a territorial thing it's mandatory that you submit your process in the consulate where uh, you have the proof of residency. So okay. you don't get to choose. You don't get to choose. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Rebecca. And uh, you're saying, yeah, our, our New York City VFS is at the end of February, worried we'll end up in an endless wait. And again, not a great deal that can be done about that. Hopefully you'll have uh, good help from uh, someone like Constanza, who Stephanie says, yes, Constanza is very good at what she does, very professional and knowledgeable. We are in communication with her. Thank you. Uh, not at all, Stephanie. It was definitely worth asking that question this evening. And back to Michael with that uh, tax return. Um, is it for the whole year or just since the NHR status was granted? There's your order on that one. Since uh, the NHR status was granted. Okay, thank you very much. LaRonda, interesting how Portuguese are leaving for political reasons and Americans are coming for political reasons. Yes, good point. Uh, well made there, LaRonda. And as it was said on the earlier call, um, given what might be going on uh, towards the end of the year in the United States, there may be even more um, US citizens wanting to make a home. Yes, in but our, our, our political reasons are mainly economic reasons because right. um, uh, for 
for the Portuguese um, that are starting a career now, they don't uh, they don't have much pers perspectives. Okay, so look, economic rather than ideological. Yes. Right. Interesting distinction. Thanks for that, Gilda. Um, Gail, good news. I have my NIF and Portuguese bank account, thanks to EI's help and support. Another step towards Portugal. Excellent. Celebrating that milestone. Uh, don't forget, we've got Ramar here. If you want to talk about financing and mortgages, we've got Camilla from Insurance Wealth Management. We have Jason and Henry. And thank you to Sarah for popping that note in earlier on into the chat. Moving your money to Portugal. Please get in touch. Book your free currency consultation with a member of the Spartan FX team at expatsportugal at spartanfx.co.uk. It's all in the chat or inquire via the Expats Portugal business directory. Thanks for doing that, Sarah. Any questions on any of those topics, um, do please ask them in the chat or as Diana wants to do here, put your hand up. So if you're happy to ask this live on YouTube and Zoom, Diana, go ahead. And she just put her hand straight back down again. I think that may be, that might have been a mistake or a cat. So Sometimes it's a cat, isn't it? Uh, asking a wanting to ask a question on your behalf there. Okay, um, let's go over to, um, or oh, back to John. Thank you very much. According to few citizenships, um, I, do I need to provide all my citizenships passports in the application for Portuguese nationality or is the main passport with which um, I live in Portugal enough? Just to, to remind you, I've never been in these countries of citizenship. That's John. Um, I'm not sure if you addressed that before, Daniel. I think you might have done. Uh, I think so, but I'll address it again. So basically, okay. uh, even though you may be a citizen in those countries, if you didn't live for more than a year, um, you don't need to uh, deliver the criminal record of those countries. If um, you lived in a country that it's not out of your nationality, let's say that you have a U.S. passport, but you lived in Mexico for two or three years, then you need to deliver the criminal record of that country and so on and so forth. But having a passport from other countries and not uh, being a resident there for more than a year, it doesn't entail the delivery of a criminal record in the, the, the application. And therefore, uh, from what I can gather from John, um, on his case, he, he will only need to deliver from the, the criminal record from his main passport, duly apostilled. Don't forget that the criminal record is a document that only has the validity of three months, so it has a short validity window. And for nationality purposes, um, birth certificates um, are only valid for a year. So do bear that in mind, and they, they'll need, of course, to be duly apostilled. Okay? That's great advice. Thanks for that reminder about those certificates there, Daniel. And we'll stay with you because I know you've answered this in the chat, but this could be useful for other people as well. Uh, Alex saying, if I'm working in Colombia for the U.S. Embassy for two and a half years, do I need a criminal record certificate from Colombia besides yes. the one from the U.S.? So it would be a good sure. belt and braces approach to get Indeed. one from Colombia as well. It's the same example that I was providing before. So a U.S. national that lived in Mexico for two or three years, it's something that should be disclosed and the criminal record of that country should indeed be delivered because that's what's stated in the, the Portuguese law. Uh, but if that uh, same applicant was uh, a Mexico national and a U.S. national but has never lived in Mexico, the reading that I have from the Portuguese law is that indeed the criminal record from Mexico would not be, need to be delivered because that person never lived in Mexico for more than a year. That, that's basically the, the, the gist out of this. And other situations that will need to be disclosed is if that person was a part of the military and uh, their own country um, and uh, other details that may pose a liability or a um, a risk for the Portuguese security uh, should be disclosed, of course, if that person uh, was a part of the diplomatic uh, uh, action of any other foreign country. All those things should indeed be put forward to avoid what we call here in Portugal false declarations. And this is basically um, someone stating to the Portuguese government in a Portuguese official documents things that are not true. So to avoid that, everything that is in the forums should indeed be disclo disclosed. And uh, if any assistance is needed in that regard, feel free to contact us and we will be able to support fully uh, nationality applications in our law firm. Great, Daniel. There you go, Alex. Uh, let's stay with you. Uh, Hamad is looking for a little bit more clarification in the Manifestation de Interesse. We didn't pay a fee, but just submitted online to CEF, but we paid the fee on biometric time after two years of submission. Right. to CEF. So when will be the time that will count in this case? 
And uh, I did that um, that note, and I did state it's only connected with the golden visa. So the, the process are out of the golden visa and out of the malicious on interest, the expression of interest are two different, uh, um, uh, they're, they're two different natures. The manifestation on interest, you submit the process, you wait two years, it gets approved, then you go to SEF to collect the biometric data details, and the card is approved, and at that time of the biometric data details, the fees are paid. The golden visa is a totally different animal because you submit the application and you have, um, uh, well, fees to submit the application. And you need to pay around 580 euros, give or take, with the submission out of the golden visa. But this occurs at the same time that the golden visa is submitted. Once the, the, the golden visa is submitted, then a long waiting time usually occurs. Nowadays is around 15, 16 months, give or take. Uh, it gets pre-approved and then the applicants will be called upon to collect the biometric data details. Uh, they do it and then they wait uh, four, six months more until the card is issued. And at the issuance of the car, at the, uh, at the card at this time, the um, final fees will need to be paid. And this is around 5,600 or 700 euros. So uh, there are two different processes with two different fee schedules. In the case of the Manifestas on Interest, the reading that I have from the law, uh, what it counts for nationality purposes, is the time that the, um, the application was pressed, sent online, and thus not the time that the fees were paid at uh, the, the biometric data detail collection. Great answer, Daniel. There you go, Hamad. That should help. Um, and also, does you, you continue, also, does NHR benefits to business consultants, remote workers, without qualifying activities? I'm not sure I understand your question there. Um, could you rephrase that for us, Hamad? Uh, Mr. S, who asked the question in Portuguese, um, says, comes back to you and says, Obrigado, Daniel, pela reposta, uh, with a very quaint central Portugal benhaja, which I think in Lisbon might be a fica bem, but uh, there's a benhaja. Well, um... I, I'm old school. I, I like to to use the Bayaja as well. So it's probably something that I got from my grandfather. And I like the, the Bayaja, especially with older people. So, yeah, it's uh, something that I usually use. Excellent. And Boston, he says, was very slow for me. That's why I asked Daniel. I never had a problem, but still had to wait six months. And it's what you were saying, Gilda, wasn't it? You know, some of these places are just very slow. Uh, there's not necessarily anything wrong and maybe no news is good news. So thank you for that uh, feedback there, uh, Mr. S. And Diana, you're very popular tonight, Daniel. Diana has a question for you as well. It wasn't the cat. No, no, it was I forgot to unmute. Sorry. That's um, all right. I don't. <laughs> So, Daniel, I, I hope you had a good time. You were in Fayal. Uh, yep, I, I was in Fayal. I uh, returned yesterday. Uh, so, and it was good, I hope. Um, yep. My question actually is related to ancestry, uh, citizenship by ancestry. And okay. um, I'm thinking about how the timing mattered for submitting applications for things like the Golden Visa, the NHR. Um, do you see anything on the horizon with any of the legislation around citizenship by ancestry that might um, affect kind of the timing? Like, uh, you know, should I apply right away or do I have well, some? Well, I think that you should apply as soon as possible because uh, as the queue is long and there's a long waiting game, uh, there's no point in just delaying the submission out of the application. But uh, in full honesty, um, I don't think that the ancestry nationality will be um, will be changed because th that's the last thing or the last type of nationality that uh, uh, I think it will be affected. Um, when I started working in this area 10 years or 11 years ago, if my memory stands correct, the um, time that you needed to have a residency permit to uh, obtain a nationality was six years. Then it changed for five years. But for ancestry situations, we had some uh, uh, minor changes, but nothing substantial. So I, I don't think that that is going to be a, a concern that should be in your radar. Nonetheless, um, the sooner the better because of the waiting time. OK, OK. Well, I think I'm ready to move forward now. Good, good. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Well, you know what to do then, Diana. Just approach Captain Reyes of Reyes Pelicano. And he'll, he'll help you out there. Oh, yeah, I've been emailing back and forth with okay. Daniel Sperm. <laughs> well, we, we, we want to see the full sailor suit one of these days, Daniel. <laughs> on, yes. on the I, I will search for a, a captain's cap. That'll be fantastic. That'll be superb. Okay, thank you. I'll so do much. a full webinar with, with it. 
It's going to be great. Yeah. Going to hold you to that. You know we will. Um, brilliant. Okay. Um, Gail, this might be one for the Holborn Assets Wealth Management guys. I know it is a complex topic, but could you provide a quick overview of what a Portuguese compliant investment bond is and how it can be used to wrap in inverted commas, current foreign investment portfolios to optimize taxes in Portugal. Henry, can you help with that? I'll jump in on that one. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a structure that's widely used across Europe, um, the European compliant bond, uh, specifically in Portugal. Over a period of time, you can end up having a 60 percent reduction on the capital gains of the investment as long as it's held within this type of structure. Um, but uh, yeah, it depends on the underlying assets within there that you sometimes you can be limited and also it's down to suitability for these type of structures as well. So not only is it the underlying assets to make sure that they are approved and available to be held in the portfolio, but it's um, suitability for nationality as well. It's available to certain nationals, but US nationals, it's not applicable for. So yeah, it's all down to suitability. But to go into more detail, I'd be happy to jump on a meeting and run through that. There you I'm go. Not sure. That's for you, Gail. Staying in Canada, let's stay with you, Henry, for this. Uh, for Canadian, yeah. what is the tax implication of selling a principal residence uh, that's tax-free in Canada on year one, uh, 2024, from a double taxation perspective? Can you help on such matters? Or is, is that better addressed um, with a, you know someone who deals specifically with Portuguese taxation issues and how they overlap with Canada? I think that would be more taxation element. Okay. Uh, All right. And the drop a line, Pedro P, so that we've got that and we can help you out to admin at expatsportugal.com so that we can help you with that. These overlapping tax issues, uh, as we found out from our previous webinar, can be quite uh, complicated uh, and you need to kind of work with both sides uh, to come to your own, um, not compromise exactly, but but the best solution um, between the two um, authorities in each country. So uh, sorry, can't help you more than that with Pedro, but stay in touch with us and join the forum, of course, and ask questions uh, there from people's personal experience. And you may get some answers from our community as well. Um, sorry, says Alex, my internet was breaking up as I was driving. Was was the answer uh, re whether I need a criminal record for Colombia? And as I recall, you will, Alex, uh, just to be sure there. Um, thank you very much, Gail, for that question. Thank you, Diana. I saw an apartment that I liked, but when Ivana from Casa Portuguesa inquired on the property, she was told that I have to pay 12 months up front since I don't have a guarantor. Is that normal? And does this mean most of the properties will ask for 12 months payment? Casa, uh, Casa Portuguesa founder, Gilda, can you address that? Um, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, that's common. It's it's um, it's not uh, allowed by law, uh, but what happens is that when um, the owners of uh, of the property find out that um, uh, the people that that want to the person that wants to rent uh, the place uh, is foreigner, and they know that they don't have um, a, a guarantor or they don't have a job here. Um, they want to make sure that uh, the payments are going to be done. So they will ask for uh, 12 months up front or at least six months. That okay. that will be part of the negotiation with, with the foreigner. Okay. And one another option, of course, to interface with that possibly, Camilla, uh, insurance is the insurance policy for indemnifying or to supporting the uh, owner of the property against such a problem in the absence of a guarantor. Can you tell us more about that, Camilla? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have an option that is rent renters police uh, that will guarantee the the landlord the payment. So uh, it's a um, percentile about the rental fee, uh, and we can we, we we this policy can guarantee to the landlord the payment. So it's an option when we, we don't have a guarantor or you don't want to pay up from 12 months, you can offer this option to the landlord. 
Okay, that's great, Camilla. Thank you very much for that. And all your other policies over there at Winsurance. Over the last couple of years, you've been busy tailoring policies specifically to the expat needs. So thanks for that and keep up the good work over there. Best regards to the team. I hear Nuna's got a bit of a sore throat this evening. So an ashmaliora to him, if you will, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, S, did we, I think there's a bit of confusion here. Uh, you're asking the question, you have to pay six to 12 months up front plus two years income in a Portuguese bank account. I think you're confusing what some landlords are looking for on a rental with some of the D7 requirements there. Um, let me know if, if that's the case. But what we're talking about here is how some landlords are taking advantage of the situation with foreigners coming in and asking for anything between six and 12 months up from rental, which is not lawful, but it is what um, some people are asking for. And there is a solution there uh, with insurance as well with that policy. Uh, let us know, S, if you need any further clarification on that. Uh, let's see who else is asking questions here on Zoom. Uh, thanks, Henry, for your help there um, with Gail's situation. And um, I don't know if you can comment on this, Henry. Uh, when do you think the OE 2024 tax incentive policy will be rolled out? When I asked Squire of the Shires what that meant, because I'm not entirely sure myself uh, there, it was a proposal that was read in the Portugal News as a new tax incentive. This might be of interest to Daniel and you, Henry. Is this just a bit of a, bit of a political puff on... Um, taxation and it's not a real thing that we need to consider at the moment well i think i'll leave this to to henry henry have you heard of this oe 2024 tax incentive policy that's going to be rolled out in portugal oh, i it... haven't i was going to leave that to daniel <laughs> <laughs> i haven't as well then so it doesn't exist <laughs> i'll do it i'll take it <laughs> Right. What, what I suspect this is, Squire, is how sometimes on a quiet news day, um, something will be talked about uh, by politicians. And the next thing you know, it's, uh, you know, it's been turned into a law by politicians, possibly, or a possible law, and it gets a life of its own. So I think we're still at that stage, really. And as you heard from Daniel earlier on, there's probably no chance of that seeing the light of day until well after the autumn of this year, if it ever comes about at all. And of course, um, tax incentives and policies, Daniel, are going to be talked about at the moment when politicians are looking for votes, right? There's going to be that, some of that going on. Correct. The, the, the tax system, I think, is going to be debated, and I think it should. Um, and uh, I do. the two main political uh, parties are um, considering some uh, tax rebates and tax uh, uh, cuts, and I think that that's, that's good news. Uh, because the economy does need some incentive to um, to push forward. So um, it's going to be on the news, it's going to be uh, on the mouths of every politician, but we do know that politicians do promise a lot and deliver so little. So um, we shall see what gives, uh, what will arrive into to new laws and if uh, more money is in the Portuguese or foreigners living in Portuguese lands um, and if actually everyone just pays a little bit less time taxes because in Portugal it's no different from the rest of the countries in Europe taxes are indeed quite steep comparing to uh, to the US for instance yeah thanks Daniel and it's not just politicians I think it's real estate agents as well because um, we've got uh, my Italian therapy Gina Fiore here bit of fan mail for you Henry it's Gina looking forward to our appointment next week uh, nice to put a face to a voice. Love this format. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure. Uh, moving to Portugal, just returned and found out uh, my town, says Gina, who also says, I was told by a real estate agent when I was in Portugal, he made mention there might be a degree of NHR still intact for immigrants. That could be a bit like a politician, a real, a real estate agent saying, yeah, yeah, the NHR might be back. Definitely, you should buy the house. I don't know. Um, I'm just I'm just guessing there, Gina. And as you, I think you may have heard earlier on or watched the replay, the NHR is 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 unlikely to return. And if people are talking about it, it is probably for a little bit of uh, political um, maneuvering. Uh, hello, Dream Team from Lex. Just wanted to say to those awaiting temporary visa approvals to stay positive and patient. Uh, my D7 visa approval took the DC consulate a whole sixty days. And I'm prepping for my trip over now. So DC performing fairly well by the sound of it, Gilda. Yes, uh, DC uh, was and still is uh, one of the most uh, organized uh, consulates. That's interesting to know. So uh, according to our earlier webinar, where California 
is one of the toughest states to disengage from, from a tax point of view. If you're leaving the US, it could be useful. Don't, don't, and this is just my opinion. It's not, um, it's not a fact. But to move from California to the DC area, perhaps, where well, you might get an easier time with the VFS consular over that way um, as your strategy for leaving the United States. Let's stay with you, Gilda. Uh, there, are many appoint there are many who did not get IMA appointments uh, with visas. Uh, RD7 visas have an end date. Um, oh, sorry, there's a lot more questions coming in and the question keeps moving. Um, RD7 visas have an end date on the February uh, the 6th, not long now then, uh, five days away. We have to return to Canada to deal with um, elderly parents in May. What would happen if we tried to enter Portugal in September? Will this cause our residency applications to go away? Now, this is a problem, isn't it, The um, with how this is sequenced and how people may or may not leave the country? Mm -hmm. All sorts of implications with this. What have you got to say about that, Gilda? Yes, uh, it's causing a lot of trouble. Right. Uh, what uh, what uh, we have been doing um, is the following. Um, because it's not uh, the, the client's fault, uh, we have um, making um, a requirement with a, an exposition explaining uh, that our clients got the visa, didn't get the appointment, the, um, the visa got to an, to an end, they had to leave the country uh, with a justified reason, in this case, because of the parents, and then they need to get um, a document uh, in Canada, some kind of justification from the doctors, uh, that they went uh, for to take care of the parents for uh, to check on health uh, on the health status of the parents uh, and we will make the requirement they need to take a direct flight to Portugal to enter into the Schengen area and if they have uh, any trouble getting in they will show uh, the requirement and they will call us uh, to talk with uh, with the authorities. Great. Okay. I, I must say that 80% of the times it works without our intervention. And um, the other 15%, we call, we explain, and everything works out fine. The other 5% that didn't work were in um, people trying to get in not directly from Portugal. We had to talk with like uh, people that tried to get it in in German, uh, in yeah. Holland. So it was more difficult for us to explain. So you're but, recommending a direct flight into Portugal yes, to save on that sort of hassle because they are going to be more comprehensive. They know it's like their fault. Yep. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you very much for that. I hope that helps Michael and great minds think alike. S was thinking the exact same thing, move closer to DC. And I think that is from California. And there was, as, as we conclude tonight, it's nice to have a, a cultural question uh, for the whole panel here. And I'll do that, but not before I ask this other question that came through to you, Jorda, based on your comments of uh, uh, migration out of Portugal with Portuguese people. Winton is asking, how is the balance of Portuguese leaving and other countries arriving? Do you think one day the outs will outpace the ins? Um, there is a net, uh, there is a deficit of um, of migration, isn't there? It's a net, it's a net loss to Portugal, and the population seems to be dropping. Figures I looked at for 2030 showed that the population was still decreasing as a forecast by 2030. What's your view on that, Jordan? What will be required for Portuguese people to stay? Oh, there is there is a lot of things that they will need to do. We've only and got six things, minutes. It's probably a whole and, webinar, isn't it? Yeah, and, and things will need to change a lot because it's looking bad. Uh, in in the past two years, it's looking really bad. Right. Okay. And it's a, and it's a kind of cultural thing as well, isn't it? it, it it's almost people are born in Portugal expecting. I'm to... going to explain what happened. Portuguese. Okay, cool. Portuguese is uh, has a very good education system. Yeah. Very good. Um, almost everyone in Portugal goes to college. And our universities are among um, 
the, the best universities in, in Europe. And they are almost for free. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that we have um, manpower, very, very highly qualified. Yeah. But the, then the country is uh, little and the companies are struggling because we have uh, uh, our tax rates are so high and we don't have competitive salaries. Yeah. So um, we kind of created so um, a generation of uh, so uh, much educated people. Yeah. And then we cannot pay them. We don't afford to pay these people. So they have to leave. Crazy, crazy situation, isn't it? It's culturally. really crazy. Yep. And, uh, you know, the, the Portugal's loss becomes uh, another country's gain with those highly educated yes. and able people. And of course, it's a, it's um, it's in the culture, isn't it? People have been going abroad to work from Portugal since, what, 50s? And then we need to hire people from ab abroad. Yep. to make the, the job that the Portuguese were supposed to do, but only we need to pay them less. There you go, Winton, uh, an, an, uh, an answer, a great answer to your very interesting question there. Last few minutes then, uh, very quickly, Gilda, Gail mentioned that she got uh, help from you getting a knee from Portuguese bank account. Portuguese bank accounts all sorted now? That process has, has become easy again? No, not easy again. But easy for you, for EI to make happen, right? <laughs> we just manage all right okay thank you for that um and we'll go back to linda Kay's question uh, let's ask the panel um what the i'm gonna have to sort of generalize and broaden this question out a bit but linda asked what's the classical music situation in the algarve um jason i mean you live down there have you been to a classical gig is that your bag yes yeah, my my personal favorite Carl yeah i mean i'm a big classical music fan um just on, just on a on certain nights of the week though but well, joke aside, I, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't get in front of too many classical. But I did watch a great um, brass band a little while back, but uh, classical not, not always my scene, unfortunately. Well, tell us about what your favourite music is to listen to, and how accessible is it in in Portugal? Uh, don't get a chance to listen to music, Carl. He's I've too busy, isn't he? He's too busy a, doing golden visa. A rare luxury. A rare luxury listening right. to music. Like All to right. Music. Fair enough. Thank you for that, Jason. Don't forget to tune in to the Holborn uh, Assets webinar next Thursday evening at six o'clock at a different time. Henry, have you been to a gig in Portugal? I haven't been to a gig in Portugal, no. All right. You're about That's to... That's a pretty boring up. answer, but no, yes. unfortunately yes. not. Henry... Okay, we, sorry. You're, you're about to be educated <laughs> when you're ready to do so. Uh, no answers yet for you, Linda, on classical music in the Algarve. I think we'll have some good suggestions if you make the train journey up to Lisbon, however, in just a moment. Roman, what is your favourite music and how accessible is it for you in Portugal? Well, I think you already have an idea of my answer, uh, which will look like my two other colleagues. Um, I don't have any specific type of music to listen to, and I haven't listen. been to any specific uh, gig. Even in Lisbon, I know it is a pretty, um, pretty busy uh, city in terms of like going out at night. But no, unfortunately, I haven't been to any specific thing yet. Well, I think if Kafimo, um sponsor. The, a festival you'll be able to get along won't you do a bit of networking and listen to some... with a big orange thing definitely to... with some flags there <laughs> at the <laughs> festival. all right exactly. thanks Roman. thanks Roman, for Thank that you. Camilla, um if you go out to see music in 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 lisbon what do you tend to go and see and what would you recommend to linda mm, it depends of the mood oh okay i like it uh, all kinds of music but at the moment the silence is the best music i can hear <laughs> Wow. Okay. So yes, you're yeah. favoring a bit of peace ahead of Carnival, where it's going to be yeah. really noisy. Yeah, right? Carnival is not my. It's <laughs> not my my place to be. <laughs> That's about to come up, Carnival. There, Sarah. When you've been to Portugal, have you seen any live music over here? I have. I mean, I like all gen genres of music and love listening to live music. And I was really fortunate the last time that I went to a is it a Fado dinner? F Fado, Fado. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That was wonderful. The oh. voices, the music. Yeah. Was wonderful did you, experience. Did you say which town or city that was? In Lisbon. Okay, so to come up to Lisbon, uh, Linda. Thanks, Sarah, for being here tonight. Um, so let's go then to um, the Queen of the Visas and to but to Daniel first. Um, if you're looking for classical music, 
presumably they're making the pilgrimage to the Gulbenkian and seeing the Philharmonic Orchestra there would be a good tip, wouldn't it, uh, Daniel? Yeah, that's indeed a good tip. And I'm just inserting a, li a link on the chat window uh, regarding classical music in Lisbon. I don't know the scene in, um, in uh, Algarve. I don't think there's a, a lot of offer, to be honest. But this, uh, this website, Cartaz Cultural, uh, that I've just inserted in the chat window, is good to uh, know what's uh, popping up in Lisbon regarding classical music. But oh, I, I just yeah. wanted to add one note regarding the Portuguese migration. Although it's sad to see a lot of people uh, going out, it's good. At least I do face my experience that I had outside of Portugal quite as enriching. Um, so as long as people go out, get some professional experience and come back in, I do see it with good eyes. If they go out and they never come back, then it's sad and it's the country losing uh, manpower. So there's a balance between uh, uh, international experience and um, uh, that we should uh, obtain as well with uh, Portuguese people coming out. But um, if they do the same as I did, as Gilda did, we go out, we get some professional experience and then we get back in. I think that's actually good and it's uh, enriching. Well said. Yeah, all about the balance. Thank you for adding that, Daniel. Much appreciated. So, Gilda, um, classical music, are you a fan? More uh, jazz fan. I see you posted a link very helpful yes. there. So is is jazz readily available in the capital? Yes, we have a cool jazz festival in Cascais. It's Excellent. very good. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you for being here tonight, Gilda. Uh, Mandela, okay? Oh, my God. Oh, I know. was wondering whether to ask or not. Maybe I shouldn't have. Oh, he, he now he's... I'm going to tell you. He went... Um, over the table, he just ate a uh, hot sausage, um, a cheese, a half of uh, Serra de, de Estrela cheese. He's got cheese. good taste. He's got good taste. Yeah, I thought he was going to die. He survived. Right. And yesterday he he found the um, the the door opened of the kids' cookies. And he eat a whole package of chocolate cookies. And I said, now he's going to die because he eats chocolate, chocolate cookies, yeah. a whole package. But no, what he didn't. So now I think that he's like bulletproof it to all kinds of food. What a legend. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Can you imagine there. half of a cheese, a Serra de Estrela cheese and a hot sausage? Yeah, I can. And... Um... <laughs> I he kind didn't of, die. Taking my hat off to him, really. Yes, <laughs> he's got good taste in cheese. Or you know, you as the uh, the buyer of that cheese has very good taste in cheese. Thanks for your music tips and all the links that are going into the chat there. I think Jerry, you've got something to add about classical music, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I just put a link in that we have a, a Vivaldi concert coming up, an open air concert in Koningsbrugge, in Roman ruins in Koningsbrugge. Oh, that would be amazing. Of April. amazing. I just put the link in there, so we're yeah. definitely yeah. Buy, buying tickets for that. And I'm desperately trying to copy all these links. And uh, what I'll do is I'll put them onto the forum um, and people can go in there and, and have a bit more time to look at it. Okay? That's wonderful. That's so wonderful. Great I, question. Got that. Mm. Superb. Okay, Jackie, are you there? I, we've certainly had uh, Jason and Henry telling us, uh, <clears> heralding <throat> the arrival of their webinar next week at 6. Dream Team again. But there's a social happening, I think, and that will appeal to Lex, who was asking about any Porto music suggestions. You can ask uh, Conk and Honey about that. I know there's some great expats there, the Blisses and Rockin' Ron Rogers. They're, they're really getting involved in the local music scene. Um, is that right? Is there a social coming up this weekend, Jackie? Oh, yes, I think there is. So Jerry giving us a nod on that. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Jackie. No problem, no problem. Looks like Jackie's, she looks frozen. Yes. Hank and Connie, nine o'clock Lisbon time on Saturday. Um, you can find the link on our website under the events section of our website. Social evening, come along and have some fun. Hosted by the lovely, lovely Connie and her uh junior um, trainee IT assistant Hank. I think that's his title anyway. Excellent. Thanks, Excellent. Jerry. Thanks, all of you, Dream yeah. Team. And for some strange reason, I feel the need to go and eat some sausage and cheese now. Yes, I do too. Isn't that funny? <laughs> hey, great job tonight, Dream yeah. Team. Carl, Carl, that'll probably be a hot dog. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go find that right now with Mandela, the original hot dog uh, in yeah. mind. Thanks.